This is a story set against the backdrop of the Hajj. It's a story of shortcuts, of procedural and regulatory non-compliance, and of systemic deception, all contrived to facilitate commercial priorities over those of aviation safety. It's the story of an uncontrollable fire shortly after takeoff, caused as a direct result of these shortcomings, which would ultimately claim the aircraft and the lives of all 261 passengers and crew on board. Like many accidents reviewed on this channel, this was an accident which could so easily have been prevented, had there been the understanding and willingness to do so. What follows so is a detailed and thought-provoking examination of the events leading to this disaster, and an insight into how it could all have been so easily avoided. This is the true story of Nigeria in 2120, the Desert Inferno. Hajj is an annual Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca, Saudi Arabia, the holiest of all Muslim shrines. It is a mandatory religious duty for Muslims that must be carried out at least once in their lifetime by all adults who are physically and financially capable of undertaking the journey and of supporting their families during their absence from home. The rights of each individual's pilgrimage extend over a five to six day period falling within the last month of the Islamic calendar. Although current pilgrim numbers descending on Mecca during the period of Hajj typically reach between two and a half and three million, back in the early 90s, the time period relevant to the accident in question, the numbers of foreign visitors, although more modest, still accounted for an influx of over 720,000 visitors from overseas. Such is the magnitude of this annual deluge on Mecca over a relatively short time frame that Saudi authorities have constructed a dedicated, quite architecturally distinguished terminal at King Abdulaziz International Airport in the neighbouring city of Jeddah, specifically to manage the needs of their pilgrim visitors. And it is exactly to service these needs that an annual flurry of foreign, mostly charter airlines, descends on the region, ferrying devout Muslim pilgrims to and from their homelands in 57 Islamic countries scattered across the Middle East, Asia and Africa. In the background, the Nigerian Pilgrim Board had contracted a local corporation known as Hold Trade to organise tours for those attending the 1991 Hajj. In order to fulfil this obligation, Hold Trade, for its part, had in turn secured a contract with a Saudi Arabian trading company named Al Raji, whereby the Saudi company would provide the necessary air transportation. In order to do this, the Saudi company had chartered through a separate brokerage company, aircraft from Nozal Air International, the parent company of Nation Air. Although the agreement between Al Raji and Nozal Air was not exclusively for operations to and from Nigeria, when flights did operate this route, Whole Trade had secured a further contract with Nigeria Airways, whereby it would provide ground and overflight support to Nozal Air's, or more correctly, Nation Air's line operation. To add to the complexity of the situation still further, under the circumstances of operation into and out of Jeddah, Nigeria Airways had still further subcontracted their responsibilities to a local handling agency named Areen Travel. This handling agency filled the role of passenger agent and dispatcher. They provided passenger and cargo loading services, load sheets, weather information, no time information for pilots, passenger and load manifests, overflight permissions, general decorations, and any other pre-flight documentation. The broker, who had arranged the leasing of Nation Air's aircraft, provided further additional ground support in the form of a coordinator. This individual was multilingual, was normally based in King Abdulaziz Airport itself, and was familiar with the additional operational requirements normally deemed to be outside the handling agent's area of responsibility. The coordinator would be present for all aircraft movements, with one of his roles being to assist the crew through immigration by handling their passports and communicating with the handling agent representatives, who were mainly Arab-speaking Saudi locals. With regard Nation Air's on-site team itself, 
to cover the duration of the contract, which wasn't expected to last more than a couple of weeks. The crewing complement consisted of three complete cockpit and cabin crew rotations. Supplementing these numbers was an additional flight engineer and senior captain who was providing operational support. From an engineering perspective, two mechanics and an avionics specialist had been assigned to oversee technical support, along with a designated project manager, which in total brought the final figure to 42 operational staff. Specifically, with regard to the project manager position, this had been assigned to one Aldo Tetamenti, aged 41. With over 20 years' experience in the aviation industry, he had only recently been hired by the Nation Air Planning Department, having previously worked under contract for Nation Air for a short period during the earlier months of the same year. His previous employment had been as a passenger services supervisor for Canadian Airlines International. Reporting directly to Nation Air's planning department, Tedimenti would fly in a supervisory capacity with the aircraft, alternating sectors between himself and the senior non-flying captain, who had also been assigned to provide operational support. In this role, subsequent post-accident interviewees noted that Tedimenti would often influence decisions that would ultimately impact upon maintenance and operations, often with little observed consultation. Lead mechanic Jean-Paul Philippe, age 38, was an ambitious French expat who had been chosen for the job in light of his previous experience of working in Africa. Seeking a promotion and keen to impress his superiors, he had told the general manager of Technair, Nozelaire's wholly owned maintenance provider, that this would be the smoothest deployment Technair would ever encounter. Within days, he had called all his connections in West Africa and arranged to use their hangars and personnel. Managers back at Tech and Air were indeed impressed, and despite Philippe's limited DC-8 experience and his rudimentary command of English, they were confident that they had made the right choice. Amongst his responsibilities were oversight of the flyaway kit, the infantry of equipment and spare parts which would be required to service the aircraft through the duration of the short contract scheduling the mechanic's work schedules, the reporting of maintenance activities, along with the sending of maintenance records and copies of the aircraft journey log to Techanair's Maintenance Control Centre back in Canada. He was also the one tasked with evaluating maintenance facilities and resourcing and planning necessary routine maintenance accordingly. Such day-to-day -day activities would require him to liaise with Techanair's Maintenance Control Centre for technical information, procurement of parts if necessary, and coordination of their subsequent delivery. And most importantly, despite the technical staff being qualified by various overseas regulatory authorities, the fact that none had yet secured Canadian approval meant that Philippe was also responsible for ensuring that the aircraft's flight engineers, who were so qualified, would certify the necessary maintenance work upon its completion. A procedure which, although unusual, was not actually prohibited. Although in truth, given the flight engineer's workload as part of the flight deck crew, this arrangement meant that they were often presented with requisitions for sign-offs on work which they hadn't actually seen. In other words, much of the work that the flight engineers were signing for was being certified in good faith. And this, in the context of Nigeria 2120, was something they would ultimately pay dearly for. Philippe made daily phone calls back to both Techanair's director of production and general manager, never reporting any problems, and on each call affirming that both the aircraft and operation itself were performing perfectly. But the situation was not quite what had been reported. The aircraft listed on the Canadian Register as Charlie Gulf Mike X-Ray Quebec commenced the short contract on July 2nd, nine days prior to the accident. During the late afternoon of the 2nd, the DC-8 had left Nation Air's base in Montreal, commencing a nine-hour sector across the Atlantic and much of continental Europe to the city of Athens, Greece. During the turnaround, the aircraft was refuelled, and Philippe and his team completed a transit check on the aircraft, essentially an external visual check to ensure the aircraft had not picked up any obvious problems in the previous sector. That done, the aircraft, within the hour, was again airborne, en route to its final destination, Jeddah's King Abdulaziz International in Saudi Arabia, arriving at approximately 8.40 local time the following morning, July 3rd. 
Less than 24 hours later, the first flight carrying passengers operating as Ghana Airways Flight 395 departed Jeddah at 4.50 on the morning of July 4th, its destination Conakry, Guinea. As fuel on board was limited by passenger weight and that of baggage, it was necessary to stop en route in Kano, Nigeria, a flight time of about 4 hours 30. Having refuelled, one hour 40 minutes later, the DC-8 was again airborne for its final destination of Conakry, a flight time of approximately 3.15. After refuelling, the aircraft was subsequently flown, empty, back non-stop to Jeddah, arriving at about 1.20 in the morning the following day. Two more round-trip flights were completed to Conakry, with westbound technical stops in Kano for fuel and necessary rotation of flight crew. When the Conakry flights were completed on July 6th, the aircraft was flown to Accra, Ghana, arriving at about 1945, in order to pre-position a flight crew for the forthcoming Accra Jeddah flight rotations. Later that same day, having departed for Jeddah, the aircraft was forced to turn back due to a malfunctioning weather radar, landing back at Accra at just after midnight into the early hours of July 7th. For 34 hours, the aircraft sat grounded on the ramp at Accra, while a replacement was flown in from overseas, with several flights worth of pilgrims having to be transferred to other carriers. As the morning wears on, the first in a series of events, which will ultimately culminate in the loss of the aircraft four days from now, happens today, during this period of downtime in Accra. In an effort to take advantage of this downtime, Philippe, in his own mind being proactive and no doubt wanting to impress his superiors back in Canada, had decided to attend to some routine maintenance issues. Specifically, he decided to action some of the items called for on the aircraft's upcoming A-check, this despite the fact that the check itself wasn't actually due for another 32 and a half hours of flight time. An A-check is, per regulation, a more comprehensive maintenance check than would be the case with a transit or pre-flight inspection, and is due every 125 flight hours. Of the many items called up for attention was the requirement to check, record and rectify if necessary the tyre pressure of all 10 wheels, main and nose. These precious specifications were shown on a tyre pressure chart in the aircraft's maintenance manual provided by the manufacturer, outlining the correct tyre inflation figures for any given operational weight. These figures come with a defined tolerance of plus 5 from minus 0 psi and a compensation index to allow for correction of these figures where significant surface temperature variations existed between departure and arrival airfields. It was anticipated by the tyre manufacturer Goodyear that a daily pressure leak rate of about 5% should be expected on its tyres, although tech and air personnel who were interviewed post-accident all stated that such a leak rate was seldom encountered during line operations of the DC-8. Derived from these charts, for the maximum gross design weight of £325,000 or the equivalent 147.5,000 kilos, the main wheel tyre pressure should have been 185 psi. However, if operating a weights below this figure, the manufacturer's tolerance is still allowed for an overinflation of the tyre up to this figure, implying that the underinflation scenario rather than the overinflation one was by far the more concerning. Strangely, and without explanation, the final accident report highlighted the fact that Nation Air's guidance to its own maintenance personnel was somewhat at odds with the manufacturer's figures quoted here. The airline had simply stipulated a fixed value of 180 psi as being the correct target value for main wheel tyre inflation, which although adequate for lighter gross weights, would have resulted in an underinflation scenario of up to 5 psi had the jet been operating at its maximum certified weight of £325,000 or the equivalent 147.5,000 kilos. Furthermore, the company guidance was that if pressure in the tyre was recorded to be below a figure of 146 psi, then the tyre should be replaced. Of significance, however, is the fact that 146 psi is a full 39 psi below the manufacturer's rated pressure requirement of 185, yet its criteria for a similar removal was called for 
where tyre pressure was found to be just 15 psi below that rated value, where the pressure was found to be below the rated value by 30 psi or more, the manufacturer also called not only for it, but also for its neighbour on the same axle to be removed as well. Whereas Nationair's guidance only referred to a similar dual change being required under conditions where the aircraft had been taxied with one of the two wheels completely deflated. In other words, where the manufacturer had put in place safe working guidelines, Nationair had chosen to adopt their own, which on examination were far less conservative. With the configuration of four wheels on each main landing gear bogey, the main wheel tyres on the DC-8 are numbered 1 to 8, left to right, forward to back, so that for example the left hand bogey will comprise of wheels 1 and 2 on the forward row, left to right, or outboard to inboard, with number 5 being directly behind number 1 and 6 directly behind number 2. Similarly on the right hand bogey, forward row, inboard to outboard are located tyres 3 and 4, with number 7 directly behind number 3 and 8 being directly behind number 4. That being the case, as part of the HEC Philippe had decided to initiate, he had delegated responsibility for the recording of each of the tyre pressures, not to his fellow mechanic but rather the team's avionics specialist. During his initial post-accident interview, he recalled that the pressures for tyres number 2 and 4 were on the low side, that he had recorded the low tyre pressures on the checklist sheet, and that he had discussed the situation with at least one of the flight engineers in Accra on the day in question, July 7th. He also stated that he advised both Philippe and the other mechanic about the situation, but could not recall the exact readings he had observed. In an effort to try and clarify exactly how underinflated the tyres actually were, the investigation team in addition examined the supporting documentation, subsequently making some startling discoveries. It was clear from the initials on the form and the different coloured inks used that both the avionics specialist and the junior mechanic had made declarations in relation to the aircraft's tyre pressures. But such was the difficulty in actually reading the values which had been declared that the investigation team were obliged to have the paperwork forensically examined. What they found was that the avionics specialist had recorded the number one tyre pressure as being 185 psi, normal and acceptable from both the manufacturer and Nation Air's perspective. With respect to tyre number two, the initial certifying the inspection and the colour of ink used pointed to the fact that the mechanic had made this entry and not the avionics specialist. Although the recorded value showed 180 psi acceptable from Nation Air's perspective, the forensic analysis revealed that a figure of 160 had actually been recorded initially by the avionics specialist as he had testified and was subsequently overwritten. Number 3 was recorded by the avionics specialist as being 179 psi, again, although underinflated from the manufacturer's perspective, acceptable to Nation Air standards. With regard to number 4, similar to the results of the investigation into tyre number 2, it too showed evidence of a belated entry made by the junior mechanic amending the avionics specialist's initial entry of 155 psi to one of 185. In conclusion, tyre number 5 was recorded as 180 psi, while numbers 6, 7 and 8 were each recorded as indicating 185, the latter three being acceptable irrespective of the standard used, while the former, number 5, again would have been slightly underinflated from the manufacturer's perspective. Two important things here. Firstly, with indisputable evidence that the initial recorded values for tyres 2 and 4 had been changed, was this an effort to fudge the figures in order to keep the aircraft flying? Or was it a case that the figures had been changed on foot of both tyres being reinflated? During subsequent interviews, the junior mechanic repeatedly stated that he couldn't recall when 
or under what circumstances he had initialised the record sheet, and remarkably what changes, if any, were made to the tyre pressure. Secondly, and more importantly, with the recorded pressures for tyres 2 and 4 being logged initially as 160 and 155 psi respectively, these were respectively 25 and 35 psi below the manufacturer's rated guidelines. Under such conditions, the manufacturer's guidance was that number two should have been replaced, and given the deflation recorded in tyre number four, it and its neighbour, tyre number three, should have also been removed from the aircraft. So, even given the benefit of the doubt to the junior mechanic, at best, the underinflated number two and four tyres were reinflated to the correct pressure whereas they and the neighbouring number three should have been removed completely, which categorically, in Accra on that afternoon of July 7th, never happened. Repairs completed, the aircraft was finally airborne again, departing Accra at 9.40 hours on the morning of July 8th and arriving in Jeddah at 16.15 local time that same afternoon. Just over three hours later at 19.30, on the 8th, the first flight with passengers bound for Accra departed Jeddah. As with the Conakry flights, these flights to Accra were routed through Kano in order to refuel. The second and last flight to Accra arrived at 4.50 local on the morning of the 10th. As the return flight to Jeddah on the 10th was to be the last flight out of Accra and it was to be a four hour long turnaround on the ground, Philippe's intention was to change some of the main wheels during this downtime. The plan had been to change the two nose wheels and main wheels number one, two and four. Number three, which should have already been removed on the 7th three days earlier, was however to stay in place. Philippe had decided to take advantage of the longer than normal turnaround in Accra, because firstly all of his maintenance personnel would be on site that day, and secondly, historically the formalities of trying to access the highly secure ramp at Jeddah while attempting to complete such work had previously proven difficult and extremely time consuming. As such, the crew set about preparing for the planned tyre changes. However, before work could get underway, a fax was received from Tedimenti in Jeddah bringing proceedings to an abrupt halt. The text of the message read as follows. Regarding flight to Sokoto. Top urgent. Please do all possible to get back the aircraft to Jeddah by 0800 GMT or 1100 local time Jeddah, or we stand to lose a lot. Situation with Nigerian Airways critical, they are giving our passengers away due delay. Do not let maintenance change wheels in Accra. If you have a chance call me ASAP. Following the aircraft's next arrival in Jeddah, it was scheduled to operate again westbound under the call sign of Nigeria 2120, bound for the city of Sokoto in northern Nigeria. But from the tone and content of the project manager's message, it appeared that any late arrival into Jeddah would potentially jeopardise this plan, with Nation Air presumably taking a financial hit as a result. And that simply wasn't acceptable. In what the investigation team believed was either a genuine lack of awareness on the part of the flight engineers as to the historic condition of the tyre pressures, or more alarmingly, a genuine misunderstanding of the potential dangers involved on the part of the mechanics, both subsequently agreed that with none of the tyres indicating wear to the first fabric layer, continued operation without replacement was, under the circumstances, justifiable in the short term, and as such, all maintenance action was stopped. After all, as it appeared that Philippe's sole motivation for changing the tyres in the first instance was one of convenience and a desire to eliminate any potential disruption to the schedule further down the road, rather than from any technical concerns given the previous pressure readings, the work, at least in his mind, could quite easily be postponed. Because this would be the last planned departure from Accra, all the replacement wheels and tyres were thus loaded into the cargo holds of the DC-8. It was reported that Felipe planned to explore the possibility of completing the wheel and tyre changes following the aircraft's arrival into Sokoto, where he anticipated he would have access to the required maintenance equipment needed to complete the job. And so, after just two and a half hours of the planned four-hour turnaround, at 7.30 local, 
the aircraft was once again airborne from Rakra, en route back to Jeddah. In command of the aircraft as it made its way to Jeddah that morning of the 10th was one Captain William Allen, age 47. A former Royal Canadian Air Force pilot, he had logged a career total of 10,700 hours, 1,000 of which had been gained on the DC-8 type. Colleagues described him as a jovial, robust individual who generally got along well with most people. It was said that he had a strong personality and was very forthright in expressing his opinions. Having been divorced from his wife a number of years previous, at the time of the accident, he was described as being in better spirits than he had been for a long time, and that he finally seemed to be happy with life. He was in good health, and the investigation team believed that there were no apparent outside stressors that would have affected his performance. During his upgrade to captain at Nation Air and his subsequent recurrent training, his training file reflected a disciplined, capable individual. During simulator sessions or line checks, he exhibited a professional attitude to the cockpit, with his management style, which was for the most part rated as to how well the crew performed during emergencies using appropriate standard operating procedures, as being rated normal. He was considered a capable professional pilot who demanded an exacting and professional calibre of performance from others. He went by the book. He was described as an individual who wouldn't be easily pressured into doing something which he felt was unsafe. Alan was technically minded and prided himself on knowing the aircraft systems. He was pleased to be flying with Nation Air and was described as a good company man. When questioned about the captain's ability to interact with other flight crew on the flight deck, flight crew members from Nation Air and from the military who had flown with them gave several opinions, at times contradictory. He was said to be very confident in his own ability, but at times lacked confidence in others, depending on their background. He was described as a dogmatic individual whose management style could inhibit others. He did not delegate duties well and had a tendency to micromanage, particularly with regard to first officers. Prior to the accident, a review of claims made that Allen was difficult and hard on other crew members was undertaken by the DC-8 chief pilot at Nation Air. However, after discussing the situation with some of the first officers, the chief pilot decided that the rumours were unsubstantiated and thus didn't believe it necessary to discuss the situation with the captain himself. However, that said, he did schedule a check flight to assess Alan's performance, the results of which were positive and the matter was thus considered closed. Despite this, it subsequently came to light that in preparation for the Jetta deployment, some of the prospective crews involved, both cockpit and cabin crew alike, had voiced concerns about being paired to fly with him. To his right, occupying the co-pilot's seat, was First Officer Kent Davidge, age 37. His total flight time had extended to 8,000 hours, 550 of which had been gained flying the DC-8. People enjoyed associating with the First Officer, who was described as a well-liked, good-humoured, outgoing individual who extended his help generously. Described as a very professional pilot, he had a forceful personality and was known to be outspoken at times. Conscientious and eager to learn, he was knowledgeable about the aircraft and was confident in his abilities. He was described as a keen, dedicated individual who knew his job well and who was always thinking ahead. Although having flown in Africa previously, he had not flown in this area of operation and was excited about the Jeddah deployment. His training record did, however, note that he didn't receive criticism well. This particular attitude led to his being evaluated on two occasions by another Nation Air captain with respect to flying abilities and interactions with others. This evaluation ultimately found that there were no problems with the first officer's handling or knowledge of the aircraft, but that his difficulty stemmed from a tendency to interrupt with explanations when he was being debriefed. To the rear of the cockpit at the flight engineer's station was second officer Victor Fair, age 46. His 1,000 hours of experience in the DC-8 contributed towards a grand total of 7,500. He was well thought of by both his peers and superiors, being described as a quiet, easygoing person who got along well with everyone. He was married with two children and was a devoted family man. 
in good health, similar to his colleagues, there were no identifiable outside stressors that could have affected his performance. Fair was described as a consummate professional. He was an experienced engineer who was cooperative and provided good support to his colleagues on the flight deck. He was described as conscientious and level-headed in his approach and was considered to be knowledgeable about the aircraft systems and very adept at analysing discrepancies in those systems. It was believed that if he thought something was wrong, he would have had the conviction to speak out. Following its trip eastbound at 14.05 on the afternoon of July 10th, the aircraft arrived at Jeddah's King Abdulaziz International Airport and parked at the Hajj Terminal. The aircraft was originally scheduled to leave again only six hours later at 2000 for its return westbound sector to Sokoto in northern Nigeria. But as so often happens, the disorganised nature of Hajj operations kept pushing back their departure. Halfway through refuelling, it turned out that contractual obligations had not yet been paid to the fuel provider, forcing the flight to be delayed until midnight. Subsequently, major delays were encountered with passenger processing, rounding up all the passengers, most of which had never flown before, getting them to present the correct documentation, and assigning seats on the DC-8 took so long that the departure was delayed again until 8am the following morning, July 11th, the morning of the accident. Immediately after arrival, Alan and his crew went to a local hotel. Mechanics who were travelling with the aircraft from Accra remained on scene to address a number of outstanding maintenance issues. Interviewed post-accident, the junior mechanic stated that during this time, a truss reverser track was lubricated and checked using a pneumatic air cart. A hydraulic engine-driven pump fault was corrected by fixing a defective electrical cannon plug, and a communications audio box problem was also rectified. With regard to this work, contrary to regulations, no record was ever found in the aircraft's journey log, perhaps indicative of how Nation Air was now conducting its business. Of significance, despite the issue of the low tyre pressure being known now for three days, nothing of the work done related to the aircraft's tyres. In his deposition post-accident, the junior mechanic testified, however, that he had reminded Philippe that some of the main gear tyres would need to be inflated before departure, and that the lead mechanic, for his part, had acknowledged the fact. Within three hours, these tasks were complete, and on foot of this, the maintenance crew followed on to the crew hotel. At 3am, a, a wake-up call went out to Alan and his crew, with departure from the hotel being shortly after 4. Philippe arrived at the airport with the flight crew at around 5am. One of his tasks was to carry out a pre-flight check, which, in addition to other tasks, included a check of tyre pressures using a gauge. According to times recorded on the fuel invoice, additional fuel was ordered at 5.25, with the refueler arriving at the aircraft just 10 minutes later. All in all, the process was completed by 6.15 flight engineer and completion of his pre-flight inspection, supervised the refueling of the aircraft and it's reported, instructed the handling agent to limit loading of checked in baggage to a maximum of four tons, given the fuel and passenger load of 247 pilgrims they were intending to carry. At approximately 7.55, a mere 20 minutes before takeoff and after the passengers had boarded the aircraft, the lead mechanic finally got around to the issue of the main wheel tyre pressures. He made a request to the ramp coordinator for nitrogen, stating that it was required to inflate a low tyre. Why he waited until only 20 minutes before departure to ask about the tyre pressure isn't clear. The most probable explanation was that he simply forgot until then. The coordinator passed the request to a ramp supervisor, who stated that he drove Philippe to the Saudi Tourist Travel Bureau maintenance facility. The ramp supervisor, in his post-accident deposition, stated that they were told that the nitrogen bottles were empty and that a supply wasn't available. They subsequently drove back to the aircraft and the lead mechanic informed Tetamenti of the situation, stating that the nitrogen supply would have to be requested instead from the Saudi Airlines maintenance facility on the opposite side of the airfield. This, he said, would take some time and would most probably result in a further delay to the aircraft's departure. On hearing the news, Tedimenti reportedly told them to forget it. They weren't going to delay the flight to pump up some tyres. 
especially when the wheels and tyres would be entirely replaced in a few hours when the aircraft arrived in Sokoto. The ramp supervisor who witnessed the interaction between Philippe and Tedamente recalled that given the project manager's response, he hadn't noted any objection from the lead mechanic, the assumption being that Philippe was in agreement. The aircraft would be dispatched as is. And so for the second time in a week, Tetamente had directly interfered with the general maintenance of the aircraft, subject matter of which he had no expertise or qualification. With the first, the DC-8 had, in metaphorical terms, dodged a bullet. With his second interjection, however, the aircraft and the 261 passengers and crew on board would not be so lucky, Tetamente included. Having received pushback and taxi clearance, Nigerian 2120 began moving from its remote parking position in a northerly direction towards the end of the Hajj terminal ramp. Once there, the DC-8 made two 90-degree left-hand turns to align in a southerly direction with taxiway Echo. These turns took 13 and 17 seconds respectively. The routing down taxiway Echo consisted of a straight track averaging 11 knots ground speed, at the end of which the aircraft made another 90 degree turn, this time to the right, taking an additional 16 seconds to join taxiway Romeo, now heading in a westerly direction. The aircraft's routing along the straight stretch of taxiway Romeo averaged 20 knots ground speed, with the left hand 90 degree turn subsequently being made onto taxiway Bravo taking 16 seconds before proceeding southbound on Bravo at an average ground speed of 17 knots. Completing its run down taxiway Bravo, Nigerian 2120 made a final 90 degree right hand turn to hold short of the assigned takeoff runway, 34 left. In total, from parking stand to takeoff runway, in 11 minutes the jet had covered a distance of just over 5 kilometres. As Alan and his crew readied their DC-8 for taxi and completed the after-start checklist, unbeknownst to them at the very same time, the controller manning the area control frequency was engaged in a conversation with a Saudi Boeing 737, who, 
Only minutes earlier had departed Jeddah en route to the city of Ha'il, some 830 kilometers to the northeast. Now at 70 nautical miles or 130 kilometers north of Jeddah, the aircraft, Saudi F Flight 738, was reporting pressurization problems and had declared its intention to return to King Abdulaziz International. In response, the area controller had issued the necessary clearance and instructed 738 to initially descend and maintain 5,000 feet. Although 738 did not at any time declare an emergency and was emphatic that no specific insistence would be required on arrival back in Jeddah, the circumstances surrounding its return will nonetheless introduce a bizarre and unforeseen twist into the developing storyline of Nigerian 2120. During the course of the investigation, the interviews with a cross-section of airline personnel revealed a general lack of awareness of some of the consequences associated with improperly inflated tyres. Other than for a grossly underinflated condition, most people thought that the most significant consequence of underinflation were abnormal wear patterns and reduced tyre life. A review of popular posters and training manuals showed that they tended to stress the loss of tyre longevity due to improper inflation, and this focus is emphasised in the photographs supporting the articles. Manufacturers' pamphlets and letters stated that improper inflation would result in loss of tyre carcass strength and potential tyre failure, attributing this failure potential to a heat rise in the tyre resulting from high taxi speeds. However, some manufacturers' data, based on research done in the DC-10, which also used paired tandem bogey wheels similar to the DC-8, did indicate that a tyre overload condition sufficient to precipitate a critical temperature rise in the tyre could occur if a paired tyre were to be underinflated by as little as 15%. Although ambient temperatures don't contribute significantly to the heat rise, they may precipitate an earlier tyre failure because of the higher threshold temperature of the tyre itself. With each wheel, fuse plugs are installed to bleed off excessive tyre pressure that may occur as a result of an overheating brake unit, elevating the internal temperature of the nitrogen inside the tyre. However, in the case of tyre overheating due to overload or underinflation, the heat thus generated doesn't conduct easily through the rubber to the wheel core. Consequently, a tyre heat rise sufficient to cause the tyre to fail can occur well before the fuse plug does its job. To assess the effectiveness of a visual inspection to detect an underinflated tyre, several people in the aviation industry were canvassed on the issue. Most felt that when there was a low pressure tyre on a paired axle, this tyre would be easily identifiable as it would bulge when underinflated. Conversations with tech and air maintenance leaders, technicians, mechanics, industry consultants and flight engineers showed this belief was prevalent throughout the aviation community. The perception, however, wasn't shared by the Goodyear Tire or Thompson Aircraft Tire representatives. They said that the paired, correctly inflated tire would likewise flex and bulge while supporting the underinflated one, to the extent that both would physically appear identical. In other words, visual inspection of the wheel and tire assemblies alone will do nothing to identify an underinflated condition, and is, for all intent and purpose, a complete waste of time. To prove that very point, investigators with the cooperation of tech and air maintenance personnel conducted a tyre deflation experiment. The number two tyre of a DC-8's left-hand main landing gear bogey was deflated initially in increments of 10 psi, from 180 down to 120 psi, and then further in 20 psi increments down to a minimum value of just 40 psi, while its paired wheel on the same axle, that being wheel number one, was throughout the experiment maintained at a constant pressure of 180 psi. At each stage a photographic record was made, with subsequent examination of the photographs revealing no discernible difference between the paired or any other tyre on the bogey and the number two tyre as its pressure was lowered through the 150 to 160 psi range, which is in the 15% range when underinflation becomes critical. Still further, even at the lowest pressure of 40 psi, 
except for a slightly longer tread print on the ground and a somewhat increased squareness between the tyre wall and the tread at the upper portion of the deflated tyre. There was no clear visual evidence of an underinflation condition at all. Aircraft tyres are designed to sustain several retreads. Retreaded tyres have a better wear resistance than new ones and can endure about 10% more landings. During initial use, the carcass of new tyres stretch, resulting in some stress on its thread. However, by the time a tyre is retreaded, the carcass has stopped expanding and the new thread is therefore subjected to less tension, thereby offering more resistance to abrasion. The tyres used on DC-8s have a threaded portion that contains three fabric reinforcing layers. These layers protect the tyre carcass to some extent against foreign object damage. The tyre thread, however, doesn't contribute to the carcass integrity. Even when a tyre is worn to the third fabric layer, the normal point at which it would be removed from the aircraft, it doesn't lose any structural integrity. As for the mandatory replacement criteria for any tyre, this is when the tyre has been worn to the carcass layer itself. Allowed to reach this condition, however, means that the tyre would no longer be a suitable candidate for re-threading. A worn tyre is subject to less centrifugal force because of the reduced weight of the tread. As a result, therefore, reducing the inner tensions within the tyre and associated heat buildup. Ironically, being thinner, a worn tyre actually offers slightly better heat dissipation. Regulatory stipulation for aircraft tyres call for their capability to bear weights exceeding 40,000 pounds, the equivalent of just over 18,000 kilos, while at the same time being as small and as light as possible. They're designed to flex by up to and beyond 35% when loaded. When a loaded tyre rotates, the sections of the tyre walls flex continually, with maximum distortion occurring at that point of the tyre which is in contact with the ground. As the wheel begins to roll forward and the tyre's contact with the paved surface is broken, the tyre doesn't instantaneously snap back to its original shape. The effect of being peeled off the concrete will delay ever so slightly the tyre's ability to return to its true shape. But as it does, this snapping back into shape will produce a ripple effect which is known as a traction wave. It can take several cycles before this wave is dampened out completely with underinflation aggravating this traction wave phenomenon. All this flexing causes a significant heat rise within the tyre walls. This heat will continue to rise to the point where tyre failure occurs. This characteristic is recognised by imposing a ground roll limitation when the tyre is certified, typically 35,000 feet or approximately 10,500 metres equivalent, at a normal taxi speed. Studies published by the tyre manufacturer Goodyear show that because of carcass fatigue resulting from underinflation or overload, the endurance of a tyre underinflated or overloaded by as little as 10% was 90% below the endurance of a properly inflated tyre, meaning that relatively minor underinflations can have significant adverse consequences. Other tests by the manufacturer using a dynamometer to measure the torque on the tyres at taxiing speeds, showed that when a normally inflated tyre was paired with one deflated by 38%, the correctly inflated tyre picked up 63% of the load across the two wheels, resulting in failure of the tyre after a continuous roll of just under 30,000 feet or the equivalent of about 9,000 metres. There were slight variations from one test to another, but in all cases, underinflation of a particular tyre always results in the early failure, not of the tyre itself, but rather of its overloaded axle companion. The manufacturer also assessed that there would be long-term adverse effects on a tyre's durability each time that the tyre carcass experienced significant heat rise in the tyre walls as a result of underinflation or overloading. A substantial heat rise within the tyre caused some loss of adhesion between the plies and stretching of the nylon cords. 
loss of adhesion would result in an incipient delamination of the plies, which would cause additional friction when the tyre is flexed and thus a more rapid onset of temperature increase. In general, it was found that the tensile strength of the tyre's internal nylon core decreased by approximately 25% when the tyre temperature reached 200 degrees Fahrenheit, the equivalent of 93 degrees centigrade, resulting in the tyre's decreased load carrying capabilities. Once this tensile strength had been compromised, it was noted that the tyre remained susceptible to a higher probability of catastrophic failure, even if subsequently reinflated to the recommended target value. In addition, stretching of the nylon cords would subject them to knotting, again having the potential to weaken the tyre as a whole. Thus, the manufacturer's overall assessment was that following an exposure to overheating of the sidewalls, the tyre during subsequent operations would be more susceptible to heat build-up, and after each heat rise event, the tyre's overall strength would be reduced still further. These combined adverse conditions, therefore, could limit the life of an overload or underinflated tyre to just a few takeoffs and landings. At any international airport, therefore, tyre ground roll from the terminal to the takeoff point is often within the figure of 15,000 feet or 4,500 metres. However, that said, in high ambient temperatures, as was the case in Jeddah that morning, even these modest tyre roll distances once combined with the condition of underinflation, can, and in the case of Nigeria 2120, did produce a catastrophic outcome. As the DC-8 took to runway 34 left, its takeoff weight of 313,933 pounds, or the equivalent of 142,398 kilograms, meant that each of the eight tyres on the two main landing gear bogies should have been inflated to a pressure of 183 psi. However, poor management, flawed prioritisation, critically poor communications and inadequate technical knowledge and understanding meant that this wasn't the case, with the implication of this fact about to play out in a living hell for all those involved. In advance of takeoff, what needs to be understood is the fact that no attention was afforded the tyres of the DC-8 since the first awareness of the underinflation condition, some four days previous in Accra. Thus, in the meantime, with normal operation having been continued, the underinflated tyres on wheel number two, or more accurately its same axle counterpart wheel number one, had been placed under immense duress, and with the five kilometre taxi to the takeoff runway of 34 left, this duress had become borderline critical, with the design of the DC-8 only facilitating taxi from the left-hand seat. Having positioned the jet onto the runway centreline, Captain Allen handed over control to his first officer, who they had agreed would fly the leg to Sokoto. Good morning, Nigerian crew 120. Cleared for takeoff, uh, three, four left. Alan acknowledged the takeoff clearance and Davidage advanced no, two sleepers to take off power. Okay, as Nigerian 2120 began its ill fated takeoff roll. I have control. Stable. Brakes released. Set max thrust. Max thrust. Four left 
pressure. Where are we going? You've got four low pressure lines. Yeah, we might be losing pressurization. Pressurization is uncontrolled. Level off. Okay. Uh, Nation Air 2120, we'd like to just uh, level off at 2,000 feet if that's okay. We're having a slight pressurization problem. Say call sign. I'd just like to level off at uh, 2,000 uh, feet. Not a spoiler light. You're on safe flight. Much further. Ten miles. 
1,700 feet. Jetta 2120, clear to land runway 3 for uh, land. Okay, we're coming straight in. We'll land on the left. Require emergency vehicles immediately. We have a fire. We will be ground evacuating. Jetta 2120, clear to land any runway. Clear to land. Get on the ground. I've lost elevators. Christ, I have no control. Landing gear down. At 8.26 and 25 seconds local on the morning of July 11th, 1991, Nigerian 2120 received takeoff clearance from runway 34 left at King Abdulaziz International Airport in Jeddah. On board were 14 crew and 247 passengers. Having been severely overloaded due to the underinflated condition of the number two tyre, as had been observed in similar circumstances beforehand, it was actually tyre number one which was the first to exhibit problems. Having rolled a mere 128 metres down the length of 3-4 left, only eight seconds after brake release, it had started to trace patchy rubber marks as the jet began to accelerate. Within a very short space of time, these deposits became more dense and broad as the tyre on the number one wheel continued to deteriorate. The aircraft had now reached a speed of just 30 knots, the equivalent of 55 kilometres per hour. Just five seconds later, at a speed of 40 knots or 74 kilometres per hour, the tyre on wheel number two, the root cause of all the problems in the first instance, likewise began to break up unable to support the extra load being transferred back to it in the wake of tyre number one's demise. Investigators believed that in or around this time the number two wheel physically stopped rotating completely. Although unable to say for sure exactly why, it was their belief that this had most probably occurred as a result of the tyre becoming lodged in the bogey structure and jamming the wheel as it disintegrated. Similar to its same axle counterpart, the number one tyre now also began to trace dense, broad black rubber marks in the DC-8's wake. With the tyre's rubber literally being stripped from the wheel, it was inevitable that the bare rim would make contact with the concrete surface of the runway at some stage. This indeed happened firstly with wheel number one as the aircraft passed through 50 knots or the equivalent of 93 kilometres per hour, some 21 seconds after brake release with the friction being generated between the wheel and the runway surface, resulting in a huge generation of heat and the spectacle of visible sparks emanating from the jet's left-hand main gear bogey. Although Alan and his crew were, to a large part, unaware of exactly what was unfolding beneath the belly of the DC-8, some clues did start to present themselves. As the rim of the number one wheel began to make contact with the runway surface, the cockpit voice recorder picked up an oscillating noise, which had now become clearly audible on the flight deck. Second Officer Fair at the flight engineer's panel called out, What's that? Davidage's response was almost instantaneous. You figure we got a flat tyre? The friction now being generated by the non-rotating number two wheel had by now raise the temperature of the tyre remnants above that required for a tyre fire to be self-sustaining, and as a result the left-hand gear assembly became engulfed in flames. Now at a speed of about 80 knots or nearly 150 kilometres per hour, the number one wheel finally broke apart, striking the airframe, with part of it being subsequently found post-accident, embedded solidly into the left-hand trailing edge flap assembly. Yet still no one on the flight deck nor inside the passenger cabin had fully appreciated the true extent of what was actually happening. 
Just 28 seconds after brake release, the cockpit voice recorder picked up Alan announcing 90 knots now. That point on the takeoff roll where the aircraft by definition transitions from the low speed regime to the high speed. Davidich, for his part, subsequently acknowledged the captain's call out, with events now unfolding at an alarming rate. By the time the aircraft had reached a speed of 105 knots, as well as the number one wheel having disintegrated completely, the subsequent investigation would show that the non-rotating number two wheel had been worn down to the tie bolts, these being the bolts holding the two separate halves of the wheel together. Davidage, now obviously feeling something abnormal through the rudder pedals, remarked, sort of a shimmy, like if you're riding on one of those thingamajigs. Alan, in response, indicative perhaps of his inherent suspicion of subordinates, called out to Davidage, You're not leaning on the brakes, eh? To which the first officer responded, No, I'm not. I got my feet on the bottom of the rudder. Yet despite this mounting uncertainty and confusion, Alan persisted with the takeoff, admittedly with no recorded objection from either of the other two crew members. 45 seconds after brake release, Alan called V1, the latest point at which the takeoff could be safely abandoned. Now committed to taking the aircraft into the air, the order was given to rotate, with Davidage duly applying back pressure to the control column, causing the DC-8 to pitch nose up and begin its climb into the clear Arabian sky above. The last indication of rubber traces on the runway surface were noted at about this time, approximately 2,345 metres from the threshold of runway 34 left, as the aircraft's main landing gear lifted clear of the paved surface at a speed of 167 knots, at the equivalent of 310 kilometres per hour. Just 60 seconds after brake release, Alan, as pilot monitoring, verified the aircraft was indeed climbing, with Davidage in response calling for the landing gear to be retracted, unwittingly sealing the fate of the aircraft and all of those on board. Witnesses on the ground reported that the takeoff seemed normal, except that sparks and flames were seen in the area of the left main landing gear. The flames remained visible until the landing gear was retracted shortly after takeoff, the consensus being that once the gear was retracted, there were no further abnormal signs. Although to the external observer the fire appeared to have been extinguished in reality, nothing could have been further from the truth. With the retraction of the main landing gear, all the crew had done was inadvertently brought the fire inside the aircraft, the consequence of which would become obvious all too soon. A witness below the initial flight path reported nothing unusual as he watched the DCA continue its climbing departure turn onto a westerly heading. Almost immediately after takeoff, however, it became obvious to Alan and his crew that whatever the ambiguity on the ground, things were now starting to manifest themselves in a far more sinister fashion. Just two minutes and 16 seconds after brake release, as the DC-8 climbed through 1600 feet, Second Officer Fair called out, We got four low pressure lights, followed 12 seconds later by the pressurisation is uncontrollable. Exactly which four low pressure lights Fair was referring to is somewhat ambiguous, as the only four pressure warning lights grouped together on the pilot's instrument panel were those related to engine oil pressure, the electrical circuits for which are located in the leading edge of the wings, with the only common routing point being well forward of the wheel bay area and any potential interference from the burning tyres. Likewise, there are four low fuel pressure lights at the flight engineer's station, which illuminate when the main fuel tank pump switches are either in the off position or whenever the corresponding feed pump is not operating properly, again neither situation being likely given the circumstances. During the following three minutes, in addition to whatever fare had initially seen, several other abnormal indications were presented to the crew relating to flight controls, unsafe landing gear and significantly a loss of hydraulic power. Two minutes and 37 seconds after brake release, Alan called ATC requesting a level off at 2,000 feet, citing pressurisation problems. With this attempt to communicate with Jeddah, Alan had mistakenly used the call sign Nation Air 2120 
rather than his correct call sign of Nigerian 2120. ATC, understandably confused with getting a call from what they saw was an unidentified aircraft, asked Allen to clarify once again the call sign being used, in an effort to clearly identify the aircraft with whom they were communicating. However, most probably due to the mounting workload on the DC-8's flight deck, the requested clarification wasn't forthcoming, and as such, having heard Allen's comments relating to pressurisation difficulties, assumed that he was talking to Saudi 738 the Boeing 737 returning to Jeddah and still some distance to the north of the airport. Seeing Saudi 738 clear the high terrain out to the east and anticipating that the flight would be looking for further descent, he cleared it to descend at 3,000 feet. However, complicating matters still further, Alan, having heard the controller's response, assumed that the clearance was for him and responded, understand you want us up to 3,000 feet, this time without saying any call sign at all. During the next three minutes, no call sign whatsoever was transmitted by Allen during communication with ATC, although the controller had used the call sign for the Saudi aircraft on two occasions without correction from the DC-8's crew. As a result, he had assumed that for the first six minutes following break release, all calls from the DC-8 had been coming instead from the Saudi 737, whereas instructions had been intended for it. In reality, they were continuously being acknowledged and acted upon by Allen on board Nigeria 2120. As the DC-8 approached a position approximately abeam the departure end of runway 34 left, Allen, again without using any call sign, informed ATC that they were losing hydraulics and would need to return to Jeddah. At about this time, a witness in a fishing boat just offshore saw that the aircraft was leaving a trail of smoke from its underside, this observation being corroborated by a second witness located on the aircraft grounds, who essentially said that he had seen the same thing, with smoke trailing from the aircraft as it proceeded south along the shoreline. The investigation team believed that the reason why 2120 had experienced hydraulic problems could be explained by the fact that the DC-8 has three separate hydraulic systems, a general system, a spoiler system, and a standby rudder system. The general system is pressurised to approximately 3,000 psi by two engine-driven pumps on each of the inboard engines and is divided by a priority valve into priority and non-priority distribution systems. Priority subsystems by definition include ailerons, rudder and horizontal stabiliser, with all available system pressure being directed to these flight controls in the event that total system pressure drops to a value of less than 1,700 psi. A 13 gallon capacity main reservoir, critically located in the left wing route, provides the only source of fluid for the engine driven pumps. In the event of these pumps failing, an electrically driven auxiliary pump utilises the same hydraulic supply to provide normal hydraulic power for operation of the general system. A 2 gallon capacity auxiliary reservoir, also critically located in the left wing route area, is available to the auxiliary pump for wing flap and main gear down lock operation only. A spoiler hydraulic reservoir located in the right main wheel well, aft inboard corner, contains 1.2 gallons of fluid, with the reservoir for the standby rudder being located, again, in the left main wheel well area. By all accounts, now starting to compromise the very structure of the airframe, those very components essential to the operation of the hydraulic system aboard the DC-8 were literally being consumed by the intensity of the fire raging in the left-hand wheel well area. And with their demise comes the crew's inability to any longer accurately control the jet's flight path. Four minutes after brake release, Allen called air traffic control again and reported OK levelling at 3000. If you can give us a heading back towards the runway, we'll advise you of the problem. We're declaring an emergency at this time. We believe we've blown tyres. Still in the belief that he was addressing the Saudi aircraft, the controller offered runway 16 for landing, believing that as the aircraft was approaching from the northeast, it would provide the most expeditious approach to landing. Nigeria 2120, however, at this stage, was to the west, southwest of the airfield, and undoubtedly confused the controller still further by refusing his offer. 
which from Alan's perspective was of no benefit, and actually would be completely counterproductive, forcing him to double back on the course already flown. As such, Alan advised Jeddah that in order to prepare properly for the landing, he was requesting a landing on the northerly runways. More than five and a half minutes following brake release, the Jeddah controller contacted Nigerian 2120, having noticed that it had failed to comply with his previous departure instructions. Nigerian 2120 proceed direct to radio 227 and climb flight level 150. In response, Alan declared an emergency for the second time and reported further that they were having difficulty controlling the aircraft. Only now did the controller realise that the aircraft in trouble was actually Nigerian 2120 and not Saudi S-738. With that realisation, he issued instruction to Alan to make a left turn back towards the airfield. At about this time, the subsequent investigation highlighted the fact that all power to the flight data recorder was lost. Over the next minute and a half, ATC queried Alan with regard to the aircraft's fuel endurance and number of souls on board. There also followed a brief interaction with Saudi A738, who was cleared for a visual approach to runway 34 Centre, number 2 in the sequence behind 2120, with instructions to keep the preceding aircraft in sight. 2120 was then given a final heading of 010 degrees and subsequently cleared for the ILS approach to runway 34 left, the same runway it had departed from only minutes earlier. Evidence would subsequently indicate that the fire in the DC-8's wheel well fed from the abundance of flammable rubber, hydraulic fluid and magnesium alloy had developed to such an extent that the structural integrity of the aircraft had been compromised. Of significance, was that this also meant that the bulkhead between the wheel well and the aircraft's centre fuel tank was also most probably compromised, giving rise to a deadly, effectively unlimited volume of accelerant. Thus it was believed that the fire within the wheel well spread and intensified until the cabin floor was breached and flight control systems were disabled. Within the cabin, passengers desperate to escape the raging inferno, despite the aircraft still being airborne, attempted to open the aircraft's doors. In the cockpit, as Alan extended the aircraft's gear in anticipation of a landing back at Jeddah, the increased volume of oxygen which this act unwittingly introduced to the fire was more than the aircraft could tolerate, as the DC-8 literally began to rain down burning debris on the suburban streets of Jeddah below. Horrifically, this debris actually included the burning bodies of some of those passengers on board 2120, as the aircraft's compromised structure opened the passenger cabin to the environment outside. As 2120 attempted to line up with the runway, Alan advised the tower of his intention to evacuate on landing and requested that all available rescue vehicles be mobilised. In light of the crew's difficulty in controlling the aircraft, despite their best efforts, it appeared that the aircraft was now better aligned with runway 34 centre. Here in this, the tower controller offered the availability of any runway for the landing. In the end, however, Alan, his crew and all 247 passengers, the DC-8 itself, would succumb to the raging fire on board, which was by now completely out of control. 2120 breaking up on the latter part of its approach simply hadn't enough time to reach Jeddah Airport. The aircraft dived nose first into the desert, impacting the ground at a point 9,433 feet, or the equivalent of 2,875 metres, short of the runway, killing all those on board. From brake release to impact had been no more than a mere 10 minutes. Post-accident, a partial reconstruction comprising the fuselage and wing structure in the immediate area of the main landing gear wheel wells was conducted to gain a clearer picture of the path of the fire through the aircraft. It quickly became evident that much of the wheel well area was actually missing, with definitive evidence indicating that the whole area and the adjacent bulkheads forward into the fuel tank and upward into the cabin had been completely consumed by fire prior to impact. Heat distortion was evident, but no soot. This is significant, 
given that soot does not adhere to metal with surface temperatures in excess of 375 degrees centigrade, indicating just how ferocious the fire had been. In the event of a fire within either of the left or right wheel wells, vulnerable items initially include the tyres and the hydraulic components. An intense fire increases the vulnerability because of the potential for providing pressurised hydraulic fluid to feed the fire. A burning pressurised mist of hydraulic fluid has the potential to blowtorch through metal structure. Although the supply of hydraulic fluid is limited in quantity, if the rear face of the centre fuel tank is burned through, the release of aviation fuel will rapidly increase the intensity of the fire magnesium alloy aileron pulley brackets in the wheel well, if ignited, would have significantly increased the temperature of the fire and increased the potential for involvement of the fuel stored in the centre wing tank. Depending on the fire pattern and the degree of penetration into the fuel tank, the result could be either an explosion or severe structural damage. In the case of a contained fire within the wheel well, fed by fuel through a restricted orifice, the development of the fire would be up and aft the development of a severe fire at the centre section of the fuselage would rapidly lead to a loss of structural integrity preceded by inevitable control degradation due to the loss of hydraulic power and damage to the aircraft's control cables. As the cabin floor is of a light structure, penetration of the floor could be expected at an early development. Once the cabin floor was penetrated, the conditions of heat, smoke and fire within the cabin would preclude survival for occupants in the immediate location and aft of the breach. The bodies found outside the crash site showed charring and severe impact injuries. Also found near the first body was a yellow life vest which was charred along one edge, consistent with it being folded underneath the seat and being charred in situ. This again confirmed that there was a severe fire in the cabin of the aircraft, at least 11 miles from the runway. All in all, one third of the bodies recovered showed signs of severe burns sustained prior to impact to the ground. Although the bodies of Alan and his fellow crew members, including those of Jean-Paul Philippe and Aldo Tedamenti, were subsequently identified, sadly no such efforts were extended to the 247 Nigerian pilgrims, who, in accordance with Muslim tradition, were buried in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. With the tyre's disintegration, the crew wouldn't have noticed the minimal degradation of aircraft performance. Other indications which were apparent to the crew during the takeoff roll appear to have been regarded as insignificant. At about the time that the number one tyre failed, the flight data recorder did show right rudder deflection. This may have been applied to correct a yaw to the left or to counter the effects of a light crosswind. Whatever the reason, the actual deviation from centreline would probably have been considered insignificant to the cockpit crew. The sequence of oral and other sensations caused comment within the cockpit. The captain, who had the sole authority and responsibility for initiating a rejected takeoff, queried the possibility of the first officer's inadvertent use of brakes when the first officer queried the possibility of a flat tyre. The first officer and flight engineer were certainly aware of anomalies. The only suggestion of awareness by the captain was his late call of 80 knots, if it was the result of partial preoccupation with the analysis of the available symptoms. The cues available were insufficiently demanding to make the captain believe that a reject was essential. Conditioning factors may have included the captain's training regarding takeoff decision speed and a lack of adequate knowledge of the tyre condition or the consequences of operating with underinflated tyres. There is a general view amongst pilots that other system failures may be more safely handled by continuing the takeoff and then returning to land. There is merit in this philosophy because considerable redundancy is designed into aircraft systems. Furthermore, in the event of a tyre or brake defect, it can be argued that the reduced braking efficiency may cause the aircraft to overrun the paved surface should the reject be initiated immediately prior to V1. The net result is that V1 is almost exclusively treated as an engine failure recognition speed rather than more appropriately a go, no go decision speed. What was emphatically established was that the flight was attempted with underinflated tyres. There's no evidence to prove that Alan or any of his flight crew were aware of the deficiency. If he had been, 
It may have been the case that he considered the tyre was acceptable for flight. The project manager and the lead mechanic were certainly aware. Within the first one minute of the CBO recording, for a brief periods, several voices spoke at the same time. These voices were unintelligible. Then, just after the captain called for the star check, the flight attendant said, OK, you're not going down. Although there may be many interpretations of this question, the possibility exists that the query centred around an anticipation that the captain would go and have a look at the tyre. What is difficult to accept is the idea that a maintenance person and a marketing person would be bold enough to conceal a significant defect from the crew. Why would they make a decision when they could easily pass the responsibility to another person? It may be argued that Alan, if aware of the pre-existing tyre condition, would be predisposed to reject the takeoff if he recognised a failure. The counter-argument is simply, if he suspected that the tyre had failed, he also believed that a burst tyre could be carried to destination and the wheel could be changed from the stock on board the aircraft. The recorded evidence makes a strong case for at least the first officer suspecting a tyre burst during the takeoff roll. The captain's question, you're not leaning on the brakes, eh? is difficult to rationalise. If leaning on the brakes had burst a tyre, the takeoff should have been rejected. If the question was a prompt to ensure that inadvertent braking was to be avoided from then on, it could mean either that the captain also suspected a tyre burst and believing the condition was safe to continue the takeoff wanted to avoid another, or that the captain was aware of the pre-departure state of the particular tyre, was not completely taken by surprise and believed that the remaining three tyres were sufficient to continue the takeoff safely. Or perhaps the captain believed that leaning on the brakes could cause unusual or symptoms of a burst tyre without actually causing one. Prior to V1, the captain missed a speed check by 10 knots. This could have been due to preoccupation with analysis of symptoms. It could have been preoccupation with the process of decision making, or it could have been a momentary aberration. After V1, noises and further conversation recorded on the CVR make it very difficult to believe that the captain could not have suspected a tyre burst on the runway. As soon as the aircraft became airborne with the positive rate of climb, the first officer called gear up and the captain raised the gear. There was no suggestion by any crew member that the gear should be left down for any reason. Because the DC-8 has no tyre pressure sensors, no temperature sensors or fire detectors in the wheel wells, and because the tyres are not visible from anywhere inside the aircraft, the flight crew did not have enough information to evaluate the situation and make appropriate and timely decisions during taxi, takeoff or while airborne. The crew was forced to use their experience of normal vibration, noise and performance for reference. Reliance on secondary indications is fraught with difficulties, particularly non-identification or misidentification of a problem, and more importantly in this case, a denial that the noise and vibration is a problem at all. The reliance on secondary indications is problematic at the best of times, but is more so during critical phases of flight, when the additional time required for identification and evaluation of the problem is not available. Interview evidence indicated that the majority of flight crews felt that the detection of a tyre or wheel failure in the DC-8 would be unlikely, citing the noisy environment and the location of the landing gear as reasons. The majority of those interviewed who had experienced a tyre or wheel failure on takeoff or landing stated that they were unaware of anything untoward. In fact, some stated that it wasn't until ATC notified them of debris on the runway that they were aware of a problem at all. The in-flight director normally sat next to the cockpit door. The purser normally sat at the rear with a clear view of the full length of the cabin, with a passenger seat at 21D being designated for a flight attendant. If for the flight attendants seated at 12C and 39C, also in the middle cabin noticed anything reportable during the takeoff roll, the only method for communicating with the in-flight director was through the public address system. That being the case, Realistically, it's unlikely that they would have used the public address system to broadcast their concerns to all of the passengers as well as the in-flight director. For the flight attendant in seat 21D, there was actually no direct means of communication with any other crew member. It is likely the flight attendants, especially those stationed in the centre of the aircraft cabin, felt the vibration and or heard the flapping noise. 
However, even if perceived, it is possible that the significance of such indications was not recognised because flight attendants are not trained to identify abnormal system or operating situations. The cabin crew might also have assumed that the flight crew were aware of the situation. Nation Air had no procedures for cabin crew to follow in the event that an anomaly was noticed during the takeoff roll. Except for opening the cockpit door during the takeoff run, the in flight director had only the interphone system to communicate directly with the cockpit. However, because the chime that sounds in the cockpit is nearly inaudible, and because the flight crew would be disinclined to respond to it anyway during this critical phase of flight, the interphone system was not an effective tool in the event of an emergency during takeoff. Essentially, if an in flight director or other flight attendant were not to take the initiative and enter the cockpit to report an anomaly, the flight crew may not be informed of the situation at all. The in flight director did, however, enter the cockpit and reported smoke in the cabin approximately one minute after the aircraft had begun to level off at 3,000 feet and five minutes after brake release. Her report of smoke in the back, real bad, gave the flight crew their first indication that the anomalies indicated in the cockpit were due to an in-flight fire. In a multi-crew cockpit, there can be varying levels of situational awareness. Effective decisions rely on an accurate and complete picture of what's happening. If there is an absence of effective communication in the cockpit about a developing situation, then the decisions being made are based solely on the situational awareness of the decision maker. That in itself is not unsafe if the decision maker, that being the captain, is aware of the real situation. If however his assessment is incorrect, and if he is not appraised of the real situation by the other crew members, then his decisions are potentially liable to be unsafe. On takeoff, flight crews are in a go mode, and unless given clear information to do otherwise, the takeoff will continue. Analysis of the CVR of the accident flight revealed that all three flight crew members made observations about an anomaly during the takeoff roll. The observations either took the form of a question or suggestion. However, the comments and sensations led to no immediate follow up to the first officer's suspicion of a flat tire. The captain's continuance of the takeoff was based on his perception of the circumstances and his mental model of the outside world. The creation of a mental model is based not only on the information provided by one's sensory system, but also on one's training, experience, or lack thereof, and expectations. The decisions and responses that result are a reflection of that perception and mental model. The captain's training on the DC-8 as well as that of the other flight crew members did not include rejecting for tyre or wheel failures, nor was there any such requirement. At Nation Air, flight crew were trained to reject for engine fire, engine failure, or complete electrical failure prior to V1. Given this training, the captain's continuance with the takeoff was entirely consistent with his training. He had no rules or ingrained procedures to aid in his decision making when he was presented with such a tyre or wheel problem. When there are no rules, people generally resort to experience, knowledge and expectations. It is possible that Alan's experience, knowledge and expectation reflected those of other pilots interviewed. If so, he may have understood that operating with damaged tyres on takeoff to be of little consequence. This understanding would be entirely in keeping with the attitudes of those company pilots interviewed. Nation Air's experience and supported by the company training and SOPs. Simulator training is a critical component of flight crew training at Nation Air. During actual emergency, the flight crew's actions are predicated upon procedures practiced in the simulator. If there is no training and there are no SOPs, flight crews must rely on their experience. Because the DC-8 simulator used by Nation Air were not equipped or certified to simulate tyre or wheel failures, and the problem is not addressed in the company SOPs, the captain's decision making was based entirely upon his knowledge, experience and expectation. Therefore, the decision to raise the landing gear immediately after takeoff was in accordance with company procedure and followed the checklist. Any decision to leave the gear down would have been an individual airmanship decision on the part of the captain alone. Flight crews are not specifically trained for multiple unrelated failures, nor are they required to be. Because the failures appeared unrelated, the crew did not have a stable set of clues to diagnose, 
even when failures occur in an expected sequence, problem diagnosis often takes longer than problem solving. When clues indicating a problem are confusing, it is difficult to diagnose the source of the problem. During this flight, the crew were presented with an increasing workload and did not have the capacity to diagnose a probable root cause of their problems. The training items that would have been useful to the crew during this occurrence were not covered in the company training. For this accident, training issues included rejecting takeoff for suspected tyre or wheel failures and dealing with known or suspected landing gear damage after becoming airborne. Leaving such issues to airmanship presupposes a level of knowledge and expertise that was not apparent in the actions of this particular flight crew. Regardless of any possible knowledge of the tyre condition prior to takeoff, the symptoms presented while still on the runway were insufficiently demanding to cause this particular captain to reject. As such, his actions were in all likelihood representative of most other captains given the same circumstances and background. Had clear indications been made available to Alan, the takeoff would most probably have been rejected, and the accident would not have occurred. In light of all that was learned, the investigation board made a number of recommendations directed towards all interested parties, including the manufacturer, operator and regulator. Significantly, they would recommend that all public transport aircraft be equipped with wheel well overheat and fire detectors, wheel well fire protection, brake temperature sensors and tyre pressure sensors with corresponding indications in the cockpit. They prompted the use of operating manuals and procedures that were complete, current and accurate and which include actions for dealing with tyre failures during and after takeoff. They sought that training of flight crews include adequate information on tyre performance and vulnerability to ensure safe operation and the formal inclusion of crew resource management in initial and recurrent training. It was also recommended that maintenance manuals reflect the current knowledge of aircraft tyre vulnerability and that finally, personnel involved in decisions affecting airworthiness matters be specifically qualified to do so. This was the full story of Nigerian Airways Flight 2120, lost on the morning of Thursday, July 11th, 1991. The loss of Flight 2120 combined with Nation Air's poor reputation for on-time service and mechanical problems led to serious difficulties with public image and reliability amongst tour operators. These difficulties were compounded when Nation Air locked out its unionised flight attendants and proceeded to replace them with strike breakers on the 19th of November 1991, just over four months following the disaster. The lockout lasted 15 months and by the time it ended in early 1993, Nation Air found itself in severe financial trouble. At the time, the airline owed the Canadian government, hundreds of creditors and its own employees, a total of almost 75 million Canadian dollars. As a result, creditors began seizing aircraft and demanded cash up front for services rendered. The controversy was further exacerbated by reports that Robert Obadia, owner of both Nation Air and its parent company, Nozel Air, had paid himself lavish dividends and salary, while at the same time also benefiting from low interest loans taken from the company. Ultimately, poor press coverage and damaging public image pulled the company under, and it was declared bankrupt in May 1993, taking with it any remaining hope that the surviving family members would ever recoup damages for the losses suffered. Some years later in 1997, Obadia pled guilty to eight counts of fraud in relation to the company's activities. Despite this, he never served any time behind bars 
and to this date, his current whereabouts are unknown. <laughs>